Hi, everybody. My name is Matthew Pose with Audioholics. I'm here with Don with the Matt and Don Show. What's and up? We, we once again have our very special guest. So uh, Edgar Chuiri, did I pronounce it correctly this time? Great. Um, who is a, 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 uh, I know Don, like every time I tell Don we're going to bring you on, Edgar, he says, yeah, right. He's the he's actually a rocket scientist. No, he's amazing. I, I'm, I'm like... Of all the people that we talk to and everything, Edgar gets me going more than anybody. He's amazing. Thank you. I'm very flattered to hear that. Yeah. Well, and, and I'm so glad that we can have you here. Uh, so I, of course, we've had you on before, but I, I came to know your work uh, through a, a common friend who developed a really wonderful speaker, the Dutch and Dutch HC, um, but actually knew your work before that, um, in, in part because of my own passion for what I would call realism and sound reproduction, but trying to find ways to be able to hear musical reproduction in a way that reflects what you would actually hear if you were listening to the performance live. And your work, I think, has been dedicated to trying to achieve that in a way that's correct. And the more I read about your work, the more I came to realize that a lot of our approaches are fundamentally flawed and that there's just a, a need to rethink how we reproduce sound if we want it to be realistic. So we had you on before and you talked a lot about the background of uh, these aspects of, of spatial sound reproduction. And uh, this time I think we're going to talk a little bit more about specific means of reproducing sound. Um, I've referred to them here as binaural methods, uh, although really while we're going to probably talk a lot about that, um, one of the methods you're going to talk about is high-order ambisonics, which uh, can be mixed down to binaural for output, but but at the end of the day, can also be reproduced with many, many channels of speakers as well. So, Edgar, I'm going to hand it over to you. Of course, you're the expert, and I'm I'm hoping for a very rich conversation. Great. First, uh, I'm really glad to be back. Thank you for the opportunity. It's really fun to talk to people who are not only enthusiastic about audio, but open-minded about possibilities. Things are happening in changing very quickly, especially in one sector of audio, uh, which is where a lot of the advances are happening. This is the sector of augmented reality and virtual reality. Um, and uh, a lot of the innovations there, as I mentioned last time, are made by uh, wonderful, uh, smart people around the world, uh, quite often very young people in their 20s, doing their PhDs around different universities, along with many more seasoned uh, experts. Um, and one of my hobbies uh, since I was a kid is sound reproduction. And I've been one of my uh, passions recently is, is to try to bring some of these innovations that I think can enhance in, uh, the uh, enjoyment of, of listening to music at home. So um, today I am going to uh, leverage what we talked about last time. I refer to it. I'm not going to go into the same kind of detail we talked about last time and show you some of the tools that were developed in one area of spatial audio that I think has the biggest impact in terms of enhancing uh, uh, home listening of, uh, to music, especially uh, when concentrate on two channel. Although I, at some point I will show you how these tools, the same tools can be used to emulate 5.1 or 7.1 or Atmos surround sound. But the approach here is on spatial audio as distinct from surround sound, where surround sound can surround you with sound, but they cannot give you the depth and proximity and a lot of the um, uh, spatial uh, realism that you can get from, from in real life, for example, or from uh, the technique I'm going to show you. Um, so that's my introduction. Um, last, and just to remind you what we talked about last time, last time I think I argued uh, that spatial realism is, on one hand, has been most neglected because of technological difficulties that have been resolved and are being resolved and evolved and um uh so it hasn't been it has not really gotten a lot of attention from what we call high-end audio or, or audio file listening world as much as they should now it is and uh, i argued also that it's probably the most important element when it comes to realism as a whole uh, if you can fool the brain into believing sound is somewhere in spatially located even if it's totally not not perfect even if there's a bit of distortion, even if the dynamics are not perfect, uh, th that realism wins every time, uh, in my opinion, and, and in some subjective tests that we've done. So that was the main argument last time. And last time, I did an overview of three techniques. I'm not going to go over them again today. 
two techniques rely on many, many channels and many, many speakers. And these techniques are, uh, are standard techniques uh, for spatial audio that have evolved over the past uh, few decades. One, is, one of them is called wave field synthesis, synthesis, and the other one is called higher order ambisonics or ambisonics. And both techniques uh, have advantages and disadvantages. The main disadvantage is that they're not practical to get a real spatial audio uh, from um, uh, experience from loudspeakers. You need many, many loudspeakers, ideally tens of loudspeakers. Um, so initially they were created for that purpose. However, with the advent of computers and DSP, these techniques have been used virtually on the computer, as I'm going to show you to today, to allow us to do uh, spatial audio and take advantage of these techniques to get spatial audio to work with the only two speakers, as I'm going to show you. All right. So uh, before I start, um, my, my focus is going to be on a tool called Bach DSP that um, I developed over the past few years, mostly for research and development. But because I have a lot of friends and, and colleagues and uh, who encouraged me to um, give them uh, give them tools that can uh, enhance uh, uh, stereo listening at home, we then commercialize the software so it can is available from a company called Theoretica, which is a startup company from my university. But today I'm going to focus on uh, on that tool back the SP. I'll show some of the audio file tools initially that are relevant for enhancing stereo at home. But then we'll go beyond that. We'll go to all some very advanced tools that hopefully one day will be used uh, maybe sooner than we think to even enhance further spatial realism at home. Uh, but a lot of these tools are being used today either in content creation by artists and content makers and also by all kinds of audio, um, you know, for all kinds of audio experiments and audio studies. Um, you get to see this advanced tools. But we're going to start... Um, with the standard audio file type tools, which are all modules of the software. But before that, I just want to uh, summarize something about crosstalk cancellation, which is essential part of this um, uh, uh, of, of, of this approach. Uh, crosstalk cancellation allows you to get three-dimensional cues to hear from two speakers. In other words, you can perceive a three-dimensional spatial image from two speakers. Uh, if it's done correctly, you don't need more than two speakers. And if it's done correctly, as I'm going to show you later on, you can use it to emulate a surround sound pretty accurately. If if you satisfy some criteria, I'm going to show you uh, uh, in, a, in a few minutes. So that's another side uh, benefit to to the technology. But the biggest benefit is that you can take two speakers and reproduce sound convincingly as a three dimensional image. It's also uh, an, uh, one big advantage it has as opposed to the other two techniques I mentioned last time, which are wave field synthesis and HOA, higher sonics, is that this technique, which I would call binaural or even better cluster cancellation, um, allows you, it, it's completely compatible with existing recordings. And the others are not, okay? Okay, so in terms of uh, a quick preview of what I talked last time, I'm going to share my, my screen and do this quick presentation. Um, and then we'll go to the software. So before I go, any questions, comments, advice uh, so far? Uh, yeah. there, there has not been any relevant questions. Uh, I think some, some, some interested individuals and, and Wait. Don and Joey are having a, a moment. Well, Joey's a good friend of mine. I know I'm giving you a hard time. All right, I'm going to add this to the stream really quick so we can see it. So just before you get into this, Edgar, I will mention too, we talked about it last time, but I want to make sure everybody remembers that um, whereas in typical stereo reproduction and even to some extent surround sound reproduction, reflections are potentially a good thing because they help to add to our perception of, of spaciousness. That's because it's a fundamentally different way of reproducing sound from the binaural approach or the crosstalk cancellation approach, where reflections are a bad thing. They actually interfere with what you're trying to do. The way I think of it, which I think helps people to, to switch their mindset about it, is that the speakers are essentially beaming sound from them to the ear that they're supposed to be representing. So the left speaker being the left ear, the right speaker being the right ear, 
crosstalk in this case then is an error in which sound is going to which error and needs to be removed. Is that a fair way of putting it? Yes, indeed. And I'm going to show some graphics to illustrate that more accurately, but that's exactly the, the gist of it. Thank you, much. But yes, um, that's, uh, it, it, it will become clear, uh, I think, when I illustrate it with some graphics, but that's <clears> essentially <throat> the, the gist of it, of what cost of cancellation. So um, uh, if we're ready, I just want to recap very quickly some of the fundamentals and then focus on, on uh, the tools. Uh, okay, let me share the screen. Uh, am, am I showing the screen already? You yes. are, yes. You might want to hide your uh, extra Google screen there. That... Actually, uh, how about now? Yeah. Is it perfect? Different? Perfect. Okay. Yes, we can see the presentation. So, so, um, um, so last time, uh, again, I'm gonna I'm going to skip a lot of stuff I talked about last time and just focus on some of the highlights. Um, this is um, not something I want to discuss right now. So let me shift to that. So the idea of um, spatial audio is to be able to produce sound in 3D space as accurately, as convincingly as possible. And what I mean by 3D space, I mean, if you have a bird, the bird should appear not only, um, you know, uh, azimuthally, in other words, in the plane of the speakers correctly, but also if it's with some elevation, depth, if the bird comes and lands on your shoulder uh, or, or the sound of the bird, is that of a bird landing on your shoulder, you should perceive it right coming from your shoulder. And if it flies up in the sky, it should be there, not be stuck to the speakers. Now, uh, surround sound is not spatial audio. Surround sound as, um, as invented to enhance, initially the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, surround, the, uh, the audio experience watching movies. And a lot of ingenuity has gone into it to make it, uh, to make it useful for enjoyment of music. And I respect a lot of the great engineers who worked on surround sound to, to uh, give you a sense of envelopment that can be enjoyed. But surround sound, still, uh, if you put more speakers, it will put the bird. You can pan it to more speakers, but again, the, uh, you cannot that, get that bird to come and sit on your shoulder, or you cannot perceive the sound of proximity of the, or depth. Uh, you are limited by where, where the speakers are. So uh, this is a typical surround configuration the speakers are there you can pan between the speakers but you cannot get that bird to come sit on your head or fly on top of your he uh, 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 head you can put more speakers on top of your head but then again it's panned be between these top speakers there's no depth and proximity it's a wonderful medium for some aesthetic representation but in terms of spatial audio and accuracy it's not considered spatial audio in the academic sense if you go to any of the academic conferences Nobody talks about surround sound as a spatial audio or a, 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 an accurate a 3D audio representation. But it acquires its own aesthetics, and a lot of great content is in, in it. It's very enjoyable. I've set up surround sound a few years ago in my house, enjoyed it very much, and I don't think um, there's anything bad about it. We are a different goal is to get the bird, not, um, not where, you know, between the speakers or like an explosion, but typically but ha have the bird or singer appear and be able to walk and whisper in your ear that's what spatial sound uh, should be about okay so we talked about last time there are three methods wave field synthesis ambisonics and binaural and with the uh, wave field synthesis is kind of a brute force reconstruction of waves uh, many it requires many speakers and many uh, microphones uh, but in principle you can then get that bird to be up in the sky and the right place. If you put that many speakers in your living room, you'll have to have a very forgiving uh, partner who living with uh, you living with to allow you to do that. But uh, as we say, as we said last time, as Matthew reminded me, this has a very low wife approval factor. I'm not sure that's a <laughs> politically correct term, but <laughs> you get it. always that. Higher ambi or ambisonics also requires many mi uh, many uh, microphones. Except the microphones are put on a sphere. And you take advantage of some uh, mathematics, uh, for, uh, kind of mathematics called uh, spherical uh, harmonics uh, that allows you to represent the sound once you record on the, on the surface of a sphere using ideally as many microphones as possible. And you can see behind me in a minute, I'll show you. I have one that that same mic it has 32 microphones. A new one is coming up soon with 64 uh, capsules on it. But it allows you to, to uh, code spatial sound field using harmonics the same way you can code any um, 
signal, any harmonic signal, what was called Fourier component. So any sound, uh, harmonic sound, like when you pluck a guitar, you have, uh, it's made out of components called harmonics. These are spatial harmonics. You know, when you add them up, as we said last time, we can reconstruct the sound. Ideally, um, more as many speakers as, as many microphones as possible. You also need many many speakers. However, um, instead of having speakers in real life, as you see from from the right hand, uh, the bottom. I'm sorry. Uh, um, uh, you see the bottom speaker, the bottom um, picture. You see a person with a lot of speakers in that sphere. This was required to get Tyrone and Abyssonians to give you the correct spatial image. But now we can do the same thing on a computer. With the power of computer and digital signal processing, I'm going to show you we have tools where we can have virtual speakers and use that powerful technique and end up mixing everything down to two channels and delivering it through crosstalk cancellation, which is the third technique I'm going to talk about. So HOA, we're going to put it back on the shelf, come back to it when we perfect any spatial audio on two speakers. Once we do that, We'll do a trick that allows us to use this technique uh, and its advantages, which it has some advantages, uh, without the the, pro, uh, the cost and the, uh, the 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 trouble of getting so many speakers, so many amplifiers, so many cables. All that can be emulated very accurately on a computer. So the, we're going to concentrate on on the simpler technique we talked about last time, called binaural. Uh, and I'll mention in a few minutes that. I'll show you in a few minutes that, that uh, the content itself uh, to become 3D doesn't have to be binaural, but binaural is a, a way, is a good way to understand how sound uh, is, um, how humans perceive sound in three dimension and how that uh, uh, knowledge can allow us to set up a system with two speakers that can give us that experience. So we're here in three, 3D by, uh, we talked about last time, ITDQs, inter all, uh, we, we, and this has to do with the fact that time takes longer uh, when the wave takes long, uh, the sound waves take a longer time to reach one ear than the other. If you're on the right, it takes longer to for the left ear to hear the sound. And that time difference is called ITD. Humans use that. At um, higher frequency, a human brain uses ILDQs, the interall level difference. So this is, again, somebody sitting on the right, your uh, uh, sings or shouts, you'll hear him or her with a louder um, on the right ear than the left ear, your brain interprets that into all level difference as spatial cues and puts the sound there. Uh, spectral cues also we talked about last time. It's the fact that you, everybody's ear is different and everybody's ear will color the sound that enters it in a different way. By coloring, I mean tonal coloration. And you end up um, listening. We all listen tonally. We all hear tonally different content for any sound especially at higher frequencies uh and we all and as we move the sound spatially it gets colored differently and your brain uses that we call that spectral cues to help locating the sound and this is the frequency response of uh, uh, you know taking a sound and moving it up and down uh actually this is probably azimuth yeah so uh, make, moving it around and you will hear how it changes as it enters the uh, the uh, the ear canal and your brain hears those changes those, those colors so to speak and locate sound so this leads us to the binaural audio technique uh, which is the method that we're going to concentrate on today and it goes back to the early early history of uh, photography of uh, st uh, stereoscopes which are ways to see in 3d where well, you capture the image in left and uh, for the left eye and the right eye separately and present them to the left and right ear, making sure that the right ear, the right, let's see, right, right and left eye, making sure the right eye does not see the left image. And that's why you have this little wall. See that wall between the two lenses? That's called a crosstalk canceller. It stops the left eye from seeing the right image. And then you see in 3D. And that was invented shortly before the invention of photography in the 1830s. Um, so this is 3D imaging, and this is there's an uh, there's an analog for audio. If you have to take a dummy head, record it, you record the sound as it enters the two ears. Then you can, if you play it back, uh, you have to put a crosstalk canceller, which is a wall that goes back to what uh, Matthew was saying. You would need to stop the right um, channel from being heard from the left ear in order to get these cues correctly. The ILD, ITD inspector cues. So um, basically, 
Uh, let me go back to this uh, here. Well, and, and while you're doing that, I'll just mention in one of the early, uh, we'll call it inventions, but experiments done to do this used uh, essentially an analog crosstalk canceller that was just like the one you showed with the, the 3D uh, stereo video object, which was it was an acoustic barrier. Wall, that's right. The barrier, wall, right. The barrier. Uh, it's not very practical, but if you want that's to listen right. to your stereo with a door between your legs. I think we talked about that last time. Yeah, I recommend doing, doing that experiment. Go home, take two speakers, put them close to each other, put a, uh, put a, a mattress vertically between them. And that is a crosstalk canceller. Uh, we call, call it barrier crosstalk canceller. You can uh, play anything stereo that has a good stereo image. It doesn't have to be binaural. It doesn't have to be acoustic. Uh, as long as it has a good stereo image. It could be acoustic. could be pop music. And you'd be surprised. The sound would be extruded out of the speakers into 3D space. The function of that mattress is to stopping the right channel from being heard by the left ear and vice versa. And uh, this is what's being illustrated right here. Uh, sorry, let's go back to this slide right here. So uh, this is... Um, Left and right microphone in general uh, um, respond to the left and right ear. Uh, ideally, they should be inside a, a dummy head. They don't have to be. If they are, you get even more accuracy because you get the spectral cues. When you play back from a uh, left and right channel, without crosstalk cancellation, that person on the right will be smacked, will be limited to the right speaker. So you'd hear him singing from that right speaker only uh, in, in, without crosstalk cancellation. So you'd hear him appear right... Uh, there because of the crosstalk right there. And I'll explain that in a minute. Now, as soon as you put the barrier, then your brain gets those cues and that person will appear singing from the right space. And it could be also elevation. It could be a depth and it doesn't have to be only, but it could, could be, it's independent of where the speakers are. It's, it, it will reproduce the position of the sound as it was recorded, not as where the speakers are located. So here, as introduction to the software and the tools I'm going to show you, I'm going to talk about the different levels of individualization, uh, of rather, in other words, different, uh, I should say, different levels of realism. So this is a typical stereo, uh, a caricature of a regular stereo uh, um, system. You have two microphones which represent stereo recording. Now, in real life, there could be more microphones, but they're all mixed down to two channels. Uh, that, that mimic like uh, recording done with left and right microphone. Um, and these could be omnidirectional microphones, they could be hypercardio, they could be relying on capturing mostly the ILD or the ITD. Omni microphone, as we talked last time, capture ITD, it's called spaced omnis. Uh, there are microphone techniques that are used for stereo recordings where you, there are coincident techniques using cardio uh, patterns and these capture the ILD. Either way, you're capturing enough information for humans to put sound somewhere in 3D space. Now, if you if you capture it like this and play it back through a system without crosstalk cancellation, and you record a bird, the bird by necessity will be coming from the right speaker stuck there. Uh, why? Because the bird is too far to the right, and basically it builds up a lot of a lot of ILD between the right and left speaker. So, especially if you have a head between them, like if you're sitting there. Uh, you hear a, a, um, an interall level difference of more than 10 dB if, if, if the bird is far to the right. However, uh, starting about 5, 6 dB uh, difference between left and right uh, speakers, uh, the sound is panned all the way to the right. If, it's, if this channel is about 7 to 10 dB or so uh, louder on the right channel than the left channel, you will hear it mostly on the right. And therefore, that bird can not be reproduced past the right. It's stuck to the speaker. If you move the speaker, the bird will move with the speaker. And so it's, and this is why there's some, we recognize there's something wrong there. And that's because there's no uh, uh, this crosstalk. To stop that and get the ILD correctly, you add the crosstalk cancellation. Uh, the next level up is to do crosstalk cancellation without this made with a dummy head. And I'm going to show you software or the, the lowest level uh, we can do crosstalk cancellation with a with a uh, generic uh, filter done with a dummy head. Uh, if you have no access to, to your head, um, and because it's generally it's difficult to measure somebody's head enough to create an individualized filter, so that will give you a three D image, but not necessarily very accurate. So the bird will now jump out of the speakers, but may not be in the, at the same location 
perceived to be the same location by this listener as it was during the recording. So if the listener was there where the microphones were, uh, he will uh, listen, he will hear the bird in that location in space. That same listener with uh, listening to crosstalk cancellation will hear the bird in space, but will not be perfectly located where it was. But the big improvement there is that it's not anymore stuck to the right speaker because of the crosstalk cancellation. And now, now uh, the listener is getting the uh, into all level difference, typically more than 10 dB, uh, to put the sound beyond the right speaker. Okay. The next level up is to individualize the crosstalk cancellation filter. That requires making a measurement. So I'm going to show. So the first thing I'm going to show you with the software has how to make a generic uh, what we call crosstalk cancellation filter called Bach filter, generic Bach filter or universal Bach filter. That's what we call generic universal. I mean, it works for uh, anyone. It's done with a dummy head, and it's called U Bach filter. Um, and these give you pretty good 3D image, not necessarily the most accurate one, but far better than you get from from stereo. Now, if you have a way to measure your head, and luckily you don't have to measure a lot. You only have to do two, two measurements because you only have two speakers. Uh, we have developed a software that can do that for you. And you can get individualized filter, but that requires having special microphones, special hardware to do that. And then now you have an individualized uh, crosstalk cancellation filter or nuivized Bach filter, and the bird will appear much more accurately where it was in 3D space. However, this is still done with a regular stereo recording uh, so there are missing some cues. We're missing either the ITD or ILD, depending what technique you're using. We're definitely missing the spectral cues uh, until you uh, you use binaural recording. So binaural recording capture all the ILD, ITD, and spectral cues we talked about last, last episode, uh, and we reviewed quickly today. And then if you use a um, binaural recording and then use an individualized Bach filter, you get even more accuracy. Then you can individualize the binaural recording by using your own head. That's even another level of accuracy. Now we're getting to uh, recordings done with your own head. They're not commercially viable. However, there's a solution for that, as you will see later on. But um, then if you do that, then, sorry, if you do uh, uh, individualize binaural recording, meaning you use your own head to record, play it back through a crosstalk cancellation filter made with your own head, as a software I'm going to show you can do, then you'll get perfect, um, and everything, of course, all the microphones are perfectly calibrated, you can get extreme accuracy. The bird will appear in 3D space from two speakers with high depth, you know, uh, azimuth location very accurately. However, if you move your head a little bit, you lose that. Therefore, we need to add head tracking. So when you move your head with head tracking, we develop the technology that also part of the software that will move the, the bird so you always hear the bird where it was. Because we know what your head is. We can adjust the filters in real time. And that existing technology can be used to listen, of course, to not only binaural recording done with your head, because there are very few of those. You can do you, yours if you want, because you can use the same microphone that come with the software to your own recording. But it turns out any existing stereo recording will pop out in 3D space. It will extrude into 3D space because of crosstalk cancellation. It will maintain the same balance. So crosstalk cancellation is not going to change the balance. You're not going to hear something unintended by the mixing engineer or mastering engineer. It's, it's going to enhance the spatial content. It's, it's going to extrude it in 3D. So there are more levels of realism where you can now add more people uh, by using phase arrays, I'm not going to talk about today. There are some phase arrays sitting behind me where now you can beam to different people and cross that cancel the beams and have every person in the room hear a bird that what it was in 3D space. All that is working in the lab. And hopefully there'll be uh, commercial products that will be based on this. There's another company that's, uh, whose job called Bach Labs, whose job is to co commercialize the stuff that comes out of my lab. Anyway, so... That's my review of realism. So what I'm going to, I'm going to stop here for a minute uh, to take questions, but just to summarize, I am going to walk you through how one can use a software uh, called Bach DSP to create first a um, enhance the no crosstalk cancellation by adding crosstalk cancellation using non-individualized crosstalk cancellation filter that do not require that you do make a measurement with the microphone. 
And a lot of people have you done that by they're using the software at home without microphones. And um, they have reported on this. They've blogged about it, so you don't have to take my word for it. They, a lot of them, especially if you are in a room where reflections, as Matthew was saying earlier, are not dominant, you can get Costa cancellation level that high enough to significantly enhance 3D imaging. So we'll start with that in a minute. But before I go to the software, I'll stop right here and see if anybody has questions, if Don or uh, Matthew has any comments or questions. We've actually had a few. Oh, Don, were you going to say something? No. OK. Uh, we've had a few questions come in that might be worth getting into. Um, you're going to address this a little bit. But one person was asking if there are any technologies on the horizon that would make the possibility of doing these custom HRTF measurements uh, more readily. So I think you, you use the uh, essentially a block metis method, right? You're, you're putting a microphone in the ear canal. Yeah, but uh, I'm going to talk about HRTF. So HRTF, we haven't talked about it in much detail yet. However, what's needed to make a Bach filter is only two points in the HRTF. So not since we somebody mentioned HRTF, let me explain what HRTF is first. So HRTF stands for Head Related Transfer Function. Strictly speaking, it's a, a numerical description quite often obtained from measurements. And I will show you in, later on in my lab how we take these measurements inside of, uh, an echoic chamber. But everybody's head interacts with sound differently. And that interaction can be measured and quantified. And the collection of such measurements from all points in space, how sound comes from any point in space and interacts with your head, is called an HRTF. To do cross-talk cancellation, we don't need the, HR, uh, the whole HRTF. We only need the HRTF, uh, two points in the HRTF, where the speakers that you are using uh, to listen to the sound are located. And that measurement can easily be taken. Instead of taking 1,000 measurements for an HRTF, typically HRTF requires more than 1,000 measurements, we only need to take two. And that's a good segue to Bach DSP software because Bach DSP software comes with microphones and allows you to make such that measurement. Very simple. It's only two measurements. So uh, you don't need to spend. However, when we, later on, we're going to talk about HRTF because it's important and it's used, it's needed for emulating 5.1 surround sound through cluster cancellation. And there I can come back and answer how one can measure it. Now, of course, the best way to measure it is to come to an echoic chamber like ours, but there are approaches on how to do it without it, including some, um, you can solve a wave equation on somebody, uh, you know, numerically, after taking somebody's uh, uh, scan of somebody's head, there are, um, when you, you build the mesh, you solve that equation, there are, differential equation solving techniques that allow you to get the HRTF without a measurement. But right now, we don't need the HRTF to do cross talk installation. We only need two points of the HRTF. So the first approach is to do it without measurement. I'm going to show you because that is cheap. Uh, no hardware is, is involved. And I'm going to start with that. OK, so the software I'm, I'm going to be talking about is called Bach DSP. Uh, there's a bit of a description of Bach DSP on this, uh, on this company, Theoretica's website. Uh, let me see if uh, so those of you who want to learn more about it can go here and uh, let's see here we go back to SP and uh, the, all the modules are described right here on this web page so you can call theoretica.us uh, back to SP back to SP is part of a back for Mac package uh, but I'm not going to be talking about this uh, I'm not going to make a big commercial here I want to talk about um, sorry back to SP here here we go. So um, these are the modules. I'm going to show you some of these modules. Some of them are directly relevant to the home listening, like the UBAC module and back to the sound, which correspond to the different levels of spatialization I just described with my slides, with my view graphs. And then I'm going to take a break and come back and describe some very advanced techniques for navigating sound fields, uh, forming beams, forming all kinds of microphones and moving them around with your head, uh, making con uh, content and making an emulation of 5.1 surround sound. Uh, and these are not necessarily all of direct relevance to home listening yet, uh, but it can give you an idea what's coming down the pike from the world of AR, VR, and audio. Uh, all of this stuff is now out of the lab in the software. The software is like an omnibus. What, we take stuff that comes out of the lab within a few weeks, appears right in the software. Um, okay, 
So that's the introduction. The software is called BackDSP. You launch it, and you can quickly configure it here. There's an audio configurer. You can configure it right here to send the audio to your DAC, for example. It can take any USB DAC and hook up to it and sync with it. It'll be bit perfect in terms of uh, uh, clock syncing, and you know uh, it has all the audio file requirements to to work with the best DACs out there. Um, now the first level is the level I was showing right here, which is basically um, non-individualized crosstalk cancellation. So that module right here called UBAC, your UBAC, um, allows you to design a filter using a bank of measurements done with dummy heads in, in my lab. So you click on ARM. What you have to enter is the geometry of your listening, if you speak um, a geometry, where the speakers are. What's important is the angle. Since humans have a hard time measuring angles easily, we, they, they can measure distances easier. So you, you enter the distance between the two speakers, the yellow line, in centimeter or in inches, that doesn't matter. And the distance between the head and the speaker, the green line. And that will, will, uh, will calculate the angle. So this is for one meter, one meter, you get 30 degrees, an equilateral triangle. But it could be anything. Uh, you can change that distance. You can. It could be this, it could be that. Um, so we enter whatever distance you have. And you click on the word fire. This happens to be an angle of 53, maybe too too large. But whatever your speakers are, you, you enter them there. And you click on fire. So this happens to be, you, you made a filter of 36 degrees. Uh, this is the filter for if you happen to be sitting 36 degrees from your speaker. That filter is a back filter that's been designed. It's a cost of cancellation filter designed with a dummy head that um, is an average of many measurements that we have that represents roughly in typical human head. It would work for most people. It would work actually for pretty much everyone if you bracket it. So there are ways, and we, you know, uh, when the software is use we give training on people it's very straightforward you can design filters at different angles uh, audition them there's a way to audition them in live by clicking on arm clicking by ear and that will play if so a, a, you click on left you'll hear sound from the left and um, side of the speakers and you turn this dial up and down you do it by ear until that that left that sound comes right at your left ear if there are, if there are no reflections in your room it's like wearing headphones, even though there are only two speakers in front of you, the sound will appear right there. And then you know that you die at the right angle and you click on fire and you have yourself your back filter. So then now you play any music from Rune, uh, from uh, music, is even from your web browser, from uh, uh, Audio, um, Audiovana, J River, uh, any, any uh, source of music. It could be from another computer coming through a network. Um, it will be routed through back DSP. It will be filtered through the Spark filter, sent to your speakers. And if, you speak, if you're sitting right there, now there's no head tracking, so you have to sit there, uh, you will hear a uncanny 3D image, uh, better than the one you would hear if you put a barrier. Okay, So that's the first level. This is the level of non-individualized. So that's kind of the lowest level the software comes in. Uh, it's far more affordable because it doesn't require that you you buy very accurate microphones to put in your ears and pre-amplifier from the microphones and so on. So this is a lot of our young, young a lot of young people who on a budget are using this uh, software to do um, cross talk cancellation to listen to re regular stereo. And there's quite a bit of talk and blogging on the internet about it. So that's the first level. I'll stop here. Next, I'll describe what we can do with the um, the next level here, which is individualized cost of cancellation. And this, while you're getting that set up, this non-individualized one, yes. this is, is, as you said, it's the most basic. This is the most similar. There have been other uh, commercial versions of cross talk cancellation that are put in things like sound bars. And, and typically those are using less sophisticated, but also non-individualized cross talk. Yes. Cancellation what, what I is, well, I, I, this is something I mentioned last time. This cross talk cancellation, is a very spe special kind. It's optimized. In other words, it's the best cross talk cancellation you can get at any frequency. And the filter itself, that's a very important aspect, is completely flat. The frequency response of the filter is flat in the frequency domain. 
is completely flat, and that means it has no coloration. So any um, and we have and the, there's a pattern that Princeton University holds uh, for that. Uh, it actually is described right here. If you click on credits, you uh, this, this font is too small to to see on your screen. But right here are all the patterns that are being used. The, the most important patent is uh, granted all around the world um, in 2011, and it's called Spectrally Uncolored Optimal Crosstalk Cancellation. So crosstalk cancellation is optimized at every frequency, and it's completely uncolored. So uh, it makes it worthy of really high-end application. Uh, there are previous attempts, as Matthew was saying, uh, cost of cancellation existed since 1961. 64 was the first paper. It's been around for a long time. I did not invent cost of cancellation. I keep repeating that every time there's an interview. We found a way to solve the problem of coloration, and made so it made it very uh, listenable and very you know uh, compromise free in terms of audio quality. Now, one thing to mention here, as if, uh, some of you will already guessed, if you move your head slightly right to the left you will lose the, uh, the 3D image. It turns out, for reasons I'm not going to go through right now, that if you move front and back, the 3D image is very robust uh, for regular speakers, for speakers that have more or less omnidirectional pattern. Um, if you move right and left, uh, the 3D image will collapse very quickly. It will, it will sound almost like regular stereo, pretty much like regular stereo. Uh, it, it will not sound uh, 3D. Um, so that's the disadvantage of this level is that you have to sit now people it's uh, it's not like uh, you're going to hear something horrible if you move off axis it will gracefully decays into a non a non 3d image uh, most people sit down and relax in that space but there's no head tracking head tracking is then on the next module i'm going to show you um so this is called ubac or universal Bach, and this level of the software is called Bach esp intro so the next level up requires uh, comes with microphones. So here you can see uh, I, these are the same microphones I'm using to record my voice right now. And uh, you can see them right here. And uh, I'm putting them inside the head in order to record my voice. But to make a back filter that's not uh, that's individualized, you put these microphones inside your ear canals like here. Okay. So now I'm going to put them right here at the risk of making some noise in your speakers okay and um we're going to turn off the ubac filter right here and turn on now we made a, a universal filter in bin one we can make a, a filter in bin number two that's individualized that's called a regular back or custom back filter and that allows you to do also head tracking so if we turn on arm and then with arms system you turn on head tracking and now you see my head, my head is being tracked. You see the crosshair there. And there'll be, uh, you can now um, make a filter uh, with head tracking. And, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll go through the motion of it. I'm gonna put it in bin number three to show you right here. And you click on arm, click with head tracking. And when you click on um, uh, fire, you will hear sweeps coming out of your speaker, left speaker and right speaker. And these are like calibration. Now, I mean, you're not going to hear them. It's all muted. But uh, and you see a flash right there. And the flash had uh, set up uh, a, a reference where my head was in the center. Microphones will be in my ear. They record everything. It takes The whole process takes about a minute. It's like a calibration. And now um, I will make a, another measurement. There will be a voice that instructs me. You're not going to hear it right now. By moving here, flashed again, left part. You can see there's a red line right there. And there will be two sweeps coming from the speakers again. And one more measurement, extreme right. And uh, you'll see the flash in a few seconds. Here we go. So these two red lines represent the range I want to do head, uh, uh, um, head tracking. I could have used the whole room if I want, but since I'm sitting on a chair, now, uh, by the way, this the process is still going. It takes about a minute. Once it's done, it will crank up the, the back filter right here. And then you will have a, a filter that does uh, 
cross talk cancellation. Now, since I did it without, um, I did it without uh, uh, speakers. The, the measurement cannot be finished. But if there were speakers there, it would be done. So let me go back to here. Um, let she do that. And Edgar, while you're doing this, am I right in understanding that the personalized uh, crosstalk cancellation filter, the one that's done with, with microphones in your ears, typically achieves a higher amount of uh, crosstalk cancellation than you can get with the generic? Oh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let me explain. OK, uh, so let, let me just refresh here. Um, it would take me a second. Um, okay, and show you, okay. All right, so you see right here, this is the actual cross cancellation of a typical speaker in a typical room. That's the spectrum. Uh, you can see I'm getting above 15, 15 dBs right here. It's hard to see on your screen. But I'm getting way above 10 decibel, uh, starting at 200 hertz and above. Uh, so whenever you make a measurement with Bach DSP, it plots the impulse response. So you can see if we have reflections in the room here. For example, this is a very good speaker, very compact speaker. And you can see right here a reflections coming a little bit later, but very soft. This is pretty much a very good environment where not, not, not many uh, reflections as opposed to, no, this is a junk measurement. Um, let me put one right here with an actual, just one second. This is an, another kind of speaker. This is more a dynamic speaker. This is an electrostatic speaker. You can see the impulse response is much tighter. Um, but the crosstalk cancellation level um, is measured and is displayed right here. And that, uh, that is enough to put sound pretty much close to your head, all the way from infinity to close to your head. A level of 15 decibel. So humans need about 18 dB to put sound right at their ears. Um, you can put sound inside your head, all from two speakers. So uh, that is a very good level of cross talk cancellation. And as Matthew mentioned earlier on, cross, uh, uh, here in any such imaging technology, the reflections are the enemy. The reflections can detract from this. Of course, the reflections can be seen. As a matter of fact, with the software, you can find out where they are and treat them. You can put the absorber, like you can see some absorbers in this room. Oh, only the first um, first reflection. I mentioned in my last interview uh, back in September that you can either can sit closer in your field or treat the reflections and or use directive speakers. Uh, near field is the best because you can use any speakers. And by near field, it's all relative. If your room is quiet, you can near field can be just a meter and a half, two meters easily. Um, but if you have a lot of reflections, you need to sit uh, either treat them or, or sit closer. So this is typical cross talk cancellation level. You can get higher than that, but that's very good for imaging, 3D imaging. So anything you play to that bin that we just made uh, will appear in three dimension. Um, if it's recorded binaurally, it'll be perfect. It will be not perfect. It will be very convincing in terms. If it's recorded with your head binaurally, then it comes close to perfection in terms of spatial accuracy. But if it's recorded anything other than your head, there'll be some degradation, as I showed in my view graphs. But it will be significantly um, um, in three dimension, much more three dimension, much more spatial realism that you're going to get from uh, either the UBAC filter or by far much more than regular stereo. Um, so that's and, and and your head is being tracked. So as you move your head like right and left, right when you're center, that's the center filter. From here on, the software knows exactly what your head can adjust the filters in such a way that you hear seamless 3D audio all the time. Okay. And there are a number of people now using the software just to listen to music. Okay. However, the software was originally intended for research and development, and this is why it looks a bit like this because it has a lot of bells and whistles. Uh, the company that now sells the software makes a standalone processor called the Bach SP, which is a high-end audio file unit that does everything behind the scene. So right there, this is something called the Bach SP. We're not going to talk about it in much detail, but it's a, a unit that does uh, everything for you in um, from 
an iPad. You, everything's controlled by an iPad. There's only one button. It's, a, it's done with no compromise. It comes with a DAC or without a DAC. Uh, but I'm going to concentrate on the software. Uh, the software um, uses the same microphone you see right here. It has far more control. It's more complex to use, but it's also more can be adapted and can has many modules, which I'm going to show you next. Okay, so I'll stop right here, Matthew. Or Don, um, or anybody has questions about now again, I am back to this level of realism, where now we have done either regular stereo recordings with individualized cross cancellation filter, um, as opposed to the UBOC, which can does uh, non individualized. But under you guys being then generically done with dummy heads. This is going to be you made for you. Uh, you can make one for you here, one for your partner or friend in bin one, bin one, two by three. You can at any point click on bypass and see what Bach is doing. What the so that would be your regular stereo, bit in, bit out, the same way as before. Nothing changed. And that would be you can instantaneously A B to hear what Bach is doing and. The first thing you notice is there will be zero coloration to the sound. Um, for example, I can show you the frequency response of the filter. It's completely flat. And this is, I think, um, for, for like you're, the way you're describing this, I think most folks are probably maybe not understanding. You, you've been so a part of the history of crosstalk cancellation that I know you know what the old ones were like. A lot of people didn't use crosstalk cancellation because that was a technology that kind of came up and went away in part because of these colorations. But numerous companies like Carver, their sonicalography and others had put out uh, early, very generic crosstalk cancellation filters as stereo enhancers. And what people who would use those would remember them as was causing pretty serious coloration. So that while they did seem to provide this spatial enhancement, it was at the expense of the spectral balance. And so what you're describing, which I think folks need to understand in, in sort of the history of this was that not only are you providing a technology that has significantly more crosstalk cancellation than what used to be possible, but it doesn't cause this spectral shift that, that used to happen. And when I reviewed the Poke Audio L800s, which has their SDA technology, I noted two things about it. One was I had said that a lot of reviewers were noticing a bit of brightness with the speaker and had referred to it as being very revealing. What I found it to be was that, because I, I tested this, it was the effect of the SDA or the crosstalk canceler that it has built into it causing a coloration. And it was in fact a measurable coloration. I mean, I could measure the, the frequency response of the speaker with and without the SDA active. Um, the other thing was that I was never able to measure more than maybe two or three decibels of crosstalk cancellation. And I had thought that I was doing it wrong. And then you and I Edgar, had a conversation and you said, no, actually, I think that's probably about right in a typical room for that kind of technology. I wouldn't expect you to get more than a couple decibels of crosstalk cancellation. Well, um, you have to uh, uh, first, if you have to be fair, uh, you have to um, it, it's, it's strongly frequency dependent and high frequency your head adds more crosstalk cancellation because your head blocks the sound from right speaker to get to the left ear, to the other ear. And uh, But uh, on the average, you're going to get about four decibel or so. So if you measure four or five decibel on the average with pink noise, that's about right with the passive type crosstalk cancellation. It will give you some level of three-dimensionality. The, the image will expand out of the speaker, but it will not have much depth in it. And um, to get much depth, humans get need to get I, ILD on the order of 10 and 15 dB where here you can see a plot of an actual filter obtained with a uh, with a you know room that is either quiet or a speaker that's quite directive. This is that looks like an electrostatic speaker of some sort, but it, mm -hmm. actually it's a dynamic speaker. I can see the woofer right here, but it's a pretty compact speaker, and and the room is very quiet. The filter itself has strictly zero dB. It's completely flat magnitude wise up to the micro frequency. So um, you will not. It has no coloration whatsoever. And when you click on bypass, you won't hear any coloration whatsoever. When you hit when you hit B2 on, on the bin that you measured, the image will just the musicians will appear inside the room if the if these cues are there. And then you have a 3D image with no coloration. And that's the main breakthrough there is the lack of coloration as we Matthew was emphasizing. And you mentioned uh, electrostatic speakers. So for those who uh, don't understand why that matters here. 
electrostatic speakers typically have a, a dipole radiation to them, which means that there is almost no sound, very little sound radiates out to the sides. That dramatically reduces lateral reflections. And if it's more uh, even cardioid in nature, the, the dispersion from the speaker, there may be a substantially reduced rear reflection. But by reducing those lateral reflections, you're reducing some of the reflections that cause that error in the crosstalk cancellation. So essentially, these are very narrow dispersion speakers that, that happen to work well specifically for crosstalk cancellation. Yes, we can talk about this is very important point. Thanks for raising it. We spend a lot of time in my lab measuring the reactivity of many speakers. Uh, we offer this as a, uh, this is my university lab. We have here 26 speakers um, uh, that were measured in our anechoic chamber, which I will show you in a minute. We do that free service. So any company that has speakers, as a matter of fact, a company called Control uh, Control um, Audio, I think just sent us uh, some very interesting speakers with coupled cones. Uh, we are eager to measure them. Uh, we publish them without, um, you know, without having to uh, um, charge. And then this is an academic study. And we can measure, we can actually, uh, you can look at all the plots, download them. Uh, this is, for example, an electrostatic speaker that has been also, as uh, as Matthew was saying, there are dipoles. So they actually radiate the same way to the back and to the front. At the risk of being too technical here, you can see that um, this is the front and this is the back. And the back has been absorbed, so they're actually like this is a this is a, called a control plot for directivity. The more the more collimated that beam, the more directive they are, and this is why we end up with uh, something. Even though this is not a static speaker, you, you get a very compact with no reflections because the room is not being interacted. But you don't have to have electrostatic speakers. Most of our people who use Bakhti SP don't have electrostatic speakers, um, but those who do have to worry less about the room in general. All right, so the next thing I want to show you is another module, which is, um, uh, first, there's a module called Bhakti HP. I'll only describe it. Uh, if, if you click on it right here, uh, you'll get, um, and let me put a, a Bhakti HP filter in that bin right here, bin number three. Uh, what that does, you make a measurement of your speakers once and for all, um, and then you put you you put uh, your headphones on, and the headphones are plugged into um, into um, um, uh, the, the unit that comes with the microphones. It also has the headphones out, or you can take them out of your DAC. It doesn't matter. Um, and then the system will emulate your speakers because you've done a measurement with your speakers. Again, only two measurements. And you need to track head rotation. You can see here uh, the, the software is tracking where my head is. You don't need to wear something on your head to track it. It's all done optically. Um, there is a similar uh, product called Smith Realizer. Some of you have uh, heard about. It does a similar kind of emulation. This is done um, using our technology plus it has the advantage that we use also a Bach filter. Not only we can emulate the speakers, but we can emulate the speakers in three uh, with a three-dimensional sound. Uh, and we can do head tracking very accurately without having to worry about uh, wearing something on your head. So in here we need to track, track head rotation. You put your headphones on, you play any music, and you swear you're listening to the speakers. The walls will be shaking. You'll be worried about the neighbors knocking, but everything is coming from the headphones. And... Your spouse can sleep next to you while you listen to your stereo. Or you can take the software and your laptop with you on a travel and listen to your room and your speakers. So not only is emulating the speakers, it's emulating the entire acoustic environment. And there it doesn't matter if you have reflections or not. It, it emulates the whole thing. You'll hear the reflections too. Uh, if you click on that button, 3D headphones on, that will turn on the back filter for those speakers that also based on the same measurement. And then you will you will now emulate the listening experience of the same speakers with a Bach filter on, just with a click of the button. Okay, so that's the uh, next module. Now, I, I do want to mention something before you go on, Edgar. Sorry to interrupt, but sure. uh, the first part of what you described, hearing the speakers in the room, you know, there's a lot of people who like the sound of their stereo. So from just a practical, forget research for a moment, just from a practical standpoint, there are folks who would say, I, I get it. I would want to do that. 
the next thing that you talked about adding in the um, cross stock cancellation filter in essence, if I'm, if I'm correct, yes. if somebody was to want the most realistic reproduction of something with the binaural recording, you actually wouldn't do that. Cause what you're talking about is actually adding essentially the distortion of the speaker and a small degree of crosstalk back into it. Cause headphones would have no crosstalk other than whatever's in the, the electronic signal. Right. And, um, and only the distortions of the headphones themselves. The We're not adding uh, a lot of, uh, uh, headphones externalization technique add artificial crosstalk. We're not doing that. We're just measuring at your ear canal and to the canals the transfer function, so to speak, of the speakers to your, to your head. In other words, we're measuring all acoustically all that happens between the speakers and the including your room, all the reflections right. in your head, and then using that to filter the sound with it. So your brain receives the same cues and will hear your brain ear system will be satisfied with the same cues and hear your speakers. With their distortion, if there's distortion, with their character, with the room character, the experience will be uncannily indistinguishable from uh, from listening to your speakers, especially if you turn on the head tracking, the rotational head tracking. So you move your head, the image doesn't uh, move with you. Like uh, if you're wearing headphones and then you turn your head, the musicians the image move with you. Your, your brain head, yeah. knows it's not real. So you need to do head tracking. So we can fix the speakers in real in space. So when you move your head, the speakers don't move. And then only then, for most people, uh, if you don't do that, they're gonna lose the lose the illusion of the sound being externalized, and the sound will come back to, uh, to their head. And, like and I think that's a really important point you brought up. So externalization. A lot of people who listen on headphones will argue that they don't think it sounds as good as speakers. And a lot of what they're really talking about is externalization. So it's that they're they're expecting, as they probably should that the sound is coming from in front of them, because uh, typically that's where the musicians would be. When you listen to headphones, it's in your head. It's stuck typically. And it's it, it, the research that's, that you've done, actually the research Harmon even had done on this, because I've talked to uh, Todd Wolte before about what they did to find the best approach, uh, all seem to find that um, including an HRTF and including head tracking were two critical parts of the equation towards uh, achieving externalization through headphones. Yeah. The absolutely. other thing you're talking about, the sound of the speakers and its distortions, that's essentially just shifting the sound of the headphones to be more like the spectral balance of the speakers, correct? Yes. Uh, any headphones, as long as not too bad, can emulate uh, the most expensive speakers uh, to extend. I mean, any headphones, because uh, headphones are now, have almost, relative to any speakers, have a much better impulse response because they're physics. They're moving much less volume. Um, so decent headphones, you can buy headphones for $300, $400, and that'd be enough. Uh, that typically at that price range, they are so well manufactured, uh, there are enough to emulate any speakers. Okay. Uh, that's another discussion. Emulate. I didn't say sound better. Okay. I did not say sound better. As a matter of fact, uh, I don't want to go into the headphone discussion because uh, the only relevance here is that I'm using headphones to emulate speakers. This is all about speakers listening. I'm, I don't personally listen too much to headphones. At my age, most people are still stuck with speakers. My students, on the other hand, my graduate students, most of them don't even own speakers. <laughs> they all listen to headphones. But this is all about emulating speakers on headphones. Uh, uh, what, what, what is required to externalize sound and how to do it correctly is another discussion. I'd be happy to talk to you about a Sony sponsored three and a half years of research in my lab. We have a room next door called the, the Sony Wing all for headphones research. We developed a bunch of technologies. Uh, that is another topic, but we use a lot of that knowledge to produce very good speaker emulation software, which also allows us to emulate the speaker with a box filter. So you get the same experience, but wearing headphones. This is not for headphones lovers. These are for speakers lovers like myself, <laughs> who happen to have a good pair of headphones and their wife wants to go to sleep without um, and then they want to listen to a modern symphony that shakes the walls. And that's what this is for. Okay. So the next module up is a very interesting because it can be used for many, many things. Now, this module is called the 3D mixer or Bach 3DM. And when you turn it on, you can see a room right here. And there's a head of a strange looking guy um, and a bunch of dots. You can add many up to 20 dots. 
these dots can be moved. So I can take the red dot and move it in azimuth. I can move it up and down like this. Uh, I can also grab it and move it anywhere I want. And then um, uh, whenever I move it, I am actually creating a 3D image by taking a sound source. That Those dots could represent microphone feeds or re multi-channel recordings. And then saying, I want, let's say this is a violin, I want that violin to be at that point in space or the singer to be right here. And, and I can I can precisely move their, their location. Um, for example, here I can uh, I can also like, make it come all the way and go inside your head. So now that red dot is somewhere inside your head. You can zoom on it and see it. It's, uh, it's right here. See, it? it's inside your head. I can grab it, of course, and take it out. And everything I'm doing, you will hear it in 3D from two speakers. If you turn the mixer on and you have a Bach filter right here, and you're tracking the head uh, motion, and uh, you can then, what happens is actually the sound whatever it is that could be a dead, you know, like recorded in a, a mono microphone in a studio, um, or it could be an orchestral recording with multiple microphones. Uh, each of these dots is, well, technically speaking, it's being convolved. In other words, it's being filtered by the HRTF, which we talked about earlier, and I'm going to talk about a little bit more, uh, uh, that's represented by that dummy head. Okay, And then the resulting sound becomes binaural, and then it's sent to this output stage of this software. And then it's played through two speakers, and you will hear that sound there. So if you're sitting in front of the two speakers, you come here, you take that uh, dot, and you move it right there, you will hear it move there in 3D space uh, in real time. You can actually put it on a trajectory. You can go and draw, draw a trajectory like this. Um, and, um, and I'll come back and explain why this is interesting for... Uh, um for audio file listening but right now this is mostly for content creation i can deform that trajectory the way i want okay like this i can make it go through your head like this so now the trajectory goes through your head and then i can assign that red dot to it like this and now i can slide that red dot on that trajectory and you'll hear it doing exactly like this so now i can animate it so now it can start moving and um you can see here in 3D space what's going on. It's going through your head and coming out from the other side of your head. And if you're sitting in front of the two speakers, you see the sound coming from there, going like this. You perceive it coming this way. It goes through your head, comes down the other ear, and loop back. Um, and that works pretty much for everyone. Once you start going the back of your head like this, you, you might start getting some errors depending whether you match or not the HRTF used for this dummy head. So, for example, if I go like this, now most people will start getting some errors in the location from behind their head. But then you can change the HRTF. The HRTF is associated with the dummy head, comes in this library, and you can. it comes with 10, with 10 uh, HRTF. Two of them are dummy heads. The others are students in my lab. Home volunteered. We give them names from the Bach family to be anonymous, but you can toggle between them. You can change the HRTF on the fly, and you can see which of these trajectories uh, sound more what you like what you see, and then you can choose that. Now, there's a, you, you can have the luxury of coming to my lab or some other lab and get the HRTF measured, and you can drop it. There's a standard format called the SOFA format. You can add it there. Your name will appear right here. And that becomes your head, the presentation of your head. And then the accuracy goes very, very high. And there, I'm going to stop and tell you when, what's, why, is that of, why is that module of useful to audio files? Recently, a well-known audio critic came to me at the Expona show and said, Edgar, this is, sounds, sounds great. Uh, you should be able then to reproduce, instead of putting these dots, we can, we can reproduce uh, surround sound because he happens to like surround sound. So... And indeed, you can. As a matter of fact, let me turn off the trajectory. There are presets for 5.1 surround sound. I can stick on 5.1. You can see here 5.1. By the way, that green that green cube is a is a actual uh, room, and the room has its own reverb and reflections. You can change the wall material, uh, wood, uh, leather, curtains. In real time, it will emulate these uh, reflections and and ambiance. And you can change the size of the room. 
um, make it very large, many tens of meters, or only in this case, it's only two meter uh, radius. But you can dial, you can also take off the room so you don't add any reverb. And now you have yourself a 5.1 surround system, or you can put 7.1, or you can put a uh, Atmos system right here, okay? Or you can put even um, more. We can put, uh, this is seven, this is I think our 3D. Whatever it is, if you feed it these channels, you have to decode them somehow. So for this audio critic, we put the system together where we took a, um, a um, we took a, um, a HDMI output from an SACD or DVD player. We cleaned it up, reclocked it, sent it to this uh, mixer, and then we, the audio critic came to our uh, anechoic chamber. And we measured the, his HRTF. Let me show you how. So I'm going to take the camera and walk you through my lab. All right. Let's see here causing as little damage as possible. And uh, now I'm going to get away from the microphone because I cannot take the microphone with me. So I'm going to uh, just give you a preview. I'm going to walk to my to the anechoic chamber. You might not hear me very well anymore, but you get to see uh, you get to see um, the chamber and a chair where you sit and the mi microphones go inside your ear and we rotate that chair and you see uh, an arc of speakers from which we send signals. So let me walk you there. Hopefully you can still hear me. This is the uh, anechoic chamber. Uh, you can see right here a chair and uh, an arc of speakers. That chair is sitting on a turntable and that turntable rotates by controlled by a computer. Uh, the microphones go inside your ear. It takes about 10 minutes. It takes about 10 minutes to rotate 360 degrees. Hopefully you were hearing me. Um, and during that 360 degrees, a rotation that takes 10 minutes will be taking thousands of measurements. Uh, so there'll be a lot of chips and, and sweeps, sign sweeps of these microphones. And the sound is recorded at the interest of your ear canals. In 10 minutes, we'll collect all these recordings. Let's call the HRTF. It takes 10 minutes, we put on USB stick, and then you can come and drop it right here. And that becomes your head. That becomes very accurate production. And then if you play multi-channel recording, you sit in front of two speakers, the output, the speakers are being emulated. In other words, the, the sound is going to, uh, is mixed um, or convolved rather with the head rate transfer function that we measured for you. The sound is sent to your uh, the Bach filter that was done with the, your actual speakers and your own head, and bang, the speakers appear. As long as the reflections in your room are not dominant. Okay, so for, for this to work nicely to get the, the speakers appearing there uh, as equity as possible, you would need to make sure the level of reflections is not too high, and ideally, especially for the back speakers, you need to have. Either lucky, be lucky to have uh, one of these HRTF match you or get your HRTF measured. Then they're guaranteed everything will snap correctly. So again, I'll step up at this module before I show you one last feature uh, having to do with HOA because we're all coming to uh, you know um, an hour and 15 minutes already. Um, is that right? Oh, no. Oh, gosh. This is way past. No, that's right. Hour and 15 minutes. Co correct. Um, any questions here or comments? Um, well, we keep getting, oh, come on. We keep getting, uh, inappropriate stuff coming in, but actually, so one person has mentioned, um, so Dixter, uh, has, uh, made mention of the HRTF measurements. And so I think it's worth maybe bringing up a bit about how this is accomplished. So, um, you place microphones in the ear. It blocks the ear canal to do that. And I believe that's referred to as the blocked metis method. Is that yes. correct? Yes. That's and right. you, you measure the sound as it enters the ear canal. Right. And it can't measure the sound in the ear canal, only the sound to the ear canal. That's right. And that's enough for, for, for what you're trying to do. Yes. Is there any additional... So he was saying that you can still go back and correct for the 
for the effect of the inner ear canal. And I was saying, I don't think that that's correct. It depends what you're trying to do. If you're trying to build earphones, and earphones uh, will create resonances inside your ear, uh, the, the, uh, the ear channel, the ear canal itself. And so you need to compensate for those. If you're trying to use uh, speakers or headphones that have low in, uh, acoustic impedance, meaning open headphones, where the impedance between the transducer and the interstitial ear canal is very low, you don't need to worry about that. So generally for speaker, this is all about speakers. You don't need to worry about the ear canals and resonances, only, um, only the interesting. So the HRTF up to the ear entrance is that what's needed. Okay, thank you. And then we did have somebody who, um, so Galcom actually is a, a, a friend and client of mine. I was talking to him earlier today and I had mentioned he might want to join. So he has asked a question about this because it's something he's very interested in. And you were getting at this. Um, so he wants to know about Atmos mixes with objects. Can it replay it? And um, so I'll let you answer that. Yeah, I'm, I should, uh, I'm not an expert on surround sound um, uh, technologies uh, and the details of them. I can tell you that these are, they are object, you know, and channel oriented uh, techniques, but both of them, if decoded, uh, this technology allows you to replicate the speakers there so you get the same experience if everything is done correctly as having speakers there so there's nothing particular about atmos uh from the end of the uh, emulation from the emulation end that's different as long as you can decode the atmos stuff and this click of a button will set them up exactly at this one here will put the speakers where the atmos itu um, convention is and that's all that's needed and it's better to turn off the room because you don't want additional reverb so we turn off the, uh, the room right here. And then you have yourself an Atmos system. Um, and that's it. How Atmos works is uh, not something I'm going to, uh, I'm qualified to describe in detail. I know just a bit, but it's not what I do. I, I know mix engineers who mix Atmos mixes and don't know how Atmos works. So I think that's <laughs> actually quite reasonable. Well, you um, take your mix and then you put it through here and you'll hear exactly if again, if the reflections are not bad, and if your HRTF matches, which could be either measured HRTF or by selecting one of the built-in, you can get pretty close to the envelopment and uh, not the super accuracy of the back speakers. But if you want the the accuracy of the speakers' uh, location to be very very high, you need an individualized HRTF. And how to measure it is another discussion. I showed you how to measure it in the lab. There are technique. There are software out there that can measure it for you. There are all kinds of approaches i'm going to a conference in three weeks called arvr audio where a lot of people talk about it hrtf measurements how to make it simpler and more accurate we can solve it on a computer if we have a scan of your head there are all kinds of approaches but it's a holy grail of a lot of spatial audio to get it as quickly as possible we yeah. can get it in 10 minutes in an actual anechoic chamber of course one has to have all the equipment and all the software but it takes now about 10 minutes only <clears throat> So um, uh, one thing I was talking to Gautam about <coughs> that I think is maybe worth getting into a little bit here, um, and I know we're running long, but we can, we can keep going a little bit. So when you're um, thinking about differences between surround sound and spatial audio, there are certain dimensions that are used to define, we'll say academically at least, what spatial audio is, what it's doing. And one of the things that Atmos doesn't seem to do, nor does RO3D or DTS, uh, any of the other formats. And that has to do with the ability to hear sound travel to and from you, that kind of change in depth. Um, and, and you and I have talked about this before. It is something though that, that um, these binaural techniques are capable of reproducing. And it's what you refer to as the ability to place, for instance, a person right next to your head and whisper into your ear and then hear them as if they walk away. So Correct. you were showing like an object moving through somebody's head. And I think one of the differences is that if you imagine what it would be like if it was Atmos or RO3D, you've got this hemisphere, which you're kind of showing with speakers there around a person. The object really just follows the outside of the hemisphere. That's right. There's no proximity. So the proximity in depth is uh, uh, if, if there is any semblance of it is neither accurate nor stable. And that's not the intent. And they, they are, the intent is mostly in envelopment. So the surround sound gives you envelopment, but they give you no accuracy in depth or azimuth, uh, or mostly the depth prop part is. And so therefore the resolution, the spatial resolution of a sound stage would collapse into a thin sphere or a thin circle, which could be 
perfectly fine for aesthetic reasons, but it's not accurate. So you cannot use it to accurately reproduce a, a 3D sound field. You'd have to go to either wave synthesis, high or ambisonics, or binaural with crosstalk cancellation. Absolutely. That, that is a non-debatable question. Now, for aesthetic reasons, you might be perfectly fine with it. And this is why some great mixes were produced when surround sound with Atmos that I do not mean to diss them and say that they're worth it. The other way around, these are ingenious workaround to get you some feeling of, of realism. But they are incapable intrinsically to get a hologram of sound correct and accurate one. While these techniques can, in the wave synthesis in Iron Sonics, which I'm going to mention a little bit next if I have some time, um, can get you that out of speakers uh, and get you sound sound zone where if, if you if you have enough speakers and everything's done correctly, it's like a hologram of sound. Binaural audio has the advantage is that only concentrating at, at what happens at your ear canals, so it can give your brain ear system the cues it needs to hear a 3D image that can completely be completely believable and accurate if it's done correctly, especially if it's done with the only HR, if the recording is done with the only HRTF, if the decoding, if the cross cancellation is done with an individualized it, uh, filter, which this software can do, then it can be uncannily real. Uh, but it's only for you. Now, we have a way of producing multiple sweet spots using phase arrays we haven't talked about today. Maybe as in the future, we can give you... This is all developed and working. Uh, but um, so I want to emphasize that uh, these techniques, as Matthew is emphasizing here also, are all about accuracy, and depth, resolution, location, height. Uh, and it's not by panning sound artificially between speakers and um, so that's the advantage is the spatial realism and accuracy. Yeah, I, and I think we, we probably uh, should cut this short soon and do, we can just always do another one though to talk about some of these other topics that you've brought yeah. up um, so that we can give them uh, their, their fair shake. But I, I think that we've touched upon some important ideas here. And, and so I think one, one last thing I'd wanna get into maybe uh, quickly is going back to the idea of reproducing Atmos through this. So you've talked about being able to accurately reproduce Atmos. And then we've talked about the difference between what something like Atmos or any of the other surround formats have as a limitation, the lack of proximity, yeah. which is that idea of a change in depth that an object can take from, such as approaching you or leaving you. So if I understand correctly, typical stereo recordings contain maybe not all, but much of the information necessary to perceive proximity. And so a typical stereo recording could be reproduced using these binaural techniques where you would perceive proximity. But I don't believe that's true of surround and codes. Yeah. Uh, first, I, I should differentiate between the proximity and depth. Proximity is when depth becomes very little and, and you have, get, hear sound close to your head. Um, some recordings have proximity, some don't. But depth is usually captured in any good stereo recording. Uh, and this by not, uh, you know, uh, uh, cross the cancellation or back filter can uh, reproduce that correctly. Absolutely. Um, that is lacking in surround techniques. But the, the technique is so powerful, cross cancellation is so powerful that it can, if you want, and if you happen to like surround sound, have a lot of recordings, uh, reproduce it from two speakers. As a matter of fact, the, the first time we've done this experiment was years ago in Formosa Studio. At, uh, there's a uh, two Academy Award winning engineer, uh, uh, sound artist called Mark Mangini, a wonderful guy who invited me to his studio. And we took his mix and we had only two speakers 40 feet away in his wonderful studio, Formosa Studio in Hollywood. And uh, we dialed the, the Atmos configuration. We played his mix. I think it's uh, uh, Mad Max, one of these great movies he won an award for. And there were only two speakers working. We invited a colleague. His colleague sat down and said, wonderful, what's going on? And it wasn't until he saw only two level meters moving that he realized only two speakers were working, but all the, the Atmos speakers in the room were lit up as far as he thought um, were working. So this, it can be a very convincing emulation if you happen to the format. Now, I should say, I personally don't have any Atmos recordings. I don't even own a TV. I don't watch movies uh, in surround. I like movies from 40 years ago, this black and white post. So I have a peculiar taste. So I, I didn't do it for myself. And that wasn't the goal. But it turns out that the software, a lot of our surround uh, friends who love surround critics, who love surround sound, ended up 
loving it because it can do that from two speakers and save you uh, the expense and um, the you know conflicts with your partner that can be caused by having you know 14 speakers in the room. Okay, so that's the advantage of that. And but uh, it was kind of a byproduct of uh, this 3D mixer, which it originally was developed to record or uh, to mix orchestral recordings in 3D. That's the why I developed it originally, and I can tell you, give you, show you examples when we record the Berlin Philharmonic and reconstructed it in 3D. And then it turns out that mixer has many, many uses. Uh, some artists are using it to produce binaural content. One of the use, and this is why I created these these uh, preset, is the surround sound, uh, surround sound uh, emulation. But that was a byproduct. It was not really the goal, but it's a nice byproduct to have for people who like surround and want to do it from uh, from um, two speakers only. Well, that's very fair. Well, well, Edgar, if I can ever encourage you to take a vacation in Sarasota, I'll happily host you, and we can play Lestrada. How's that sound? <laughs> Great, sounds great. Yeah, I think uh, the other topic, which I don't think we, we need to at all get to today, but uh, because we come into an hour and a half, we should stop, is um, I was going to show you later on a module, uh, just as a preview for next time, the, all kinds of magic we can do with what's called HOA. And this is the mic sitting behind me right here, right here. And now when I turn it on, you can see uh, they're going to be, you know, um, you see all the channels are going to be uh, 32 channels alive and uh, let me make sure they're all on right uh, um here total mix make sure they're on for hoa so now you can see there are 32 channels live and we can do all kinds of crazy things with them we can navigate the sound field i can uh, this is a preview for next time i can turn on the camera and you can see my head navigating the sound field. I can move around and hear whatever is in the environment of this microphone. That microphone could be sitting in an orchestra. I can rotate my head and see. It's as if rotating my head in that little space. I can navigate the sound field. We develop technology. We can have four of these mics and very accurately navigate the whole concert hall um, in 3D. These are very advanced techniques. Um, they're also ways to produce beams of sound and concentrate on one part of the orchestra or or the sound field um so this is a preview of uh, maybe the next talk on hoa and how hoa can be harnessed for the pleasure uh, um, of listening to music and hoa is already making big headway in ar vr it's still almost unknown in pro audio uh, people like mark Mangini and other great visionary in audio are taking it and exploring with it still but uh, i mean early exploration but it hasn't penetrated yet audio, but it will guaranteed because it's really pure magic. It can do spectacular things. And gaming is already taking the HOA and running with it. Um, it's only, um, I, I'm pretty confident uh, it, will, it will be a tool that will benefit uh, audio listening and pro audio soon. So that's kind of a preview of maybe my, our next talk if we get to, to do another one. Uh, I think we absolutely can make that happen. Uh, sure. I know that it was a long uh, time between the last one of these we did, the part one, and now this part two. Part of that, for those of you just so you're, you're aware, is that Edgar, of course, is, is very busy with the stuff he's doing. I myself had gotten busy. I think I was in the midst of a move, <laughs> which doesn't help. Um, and we had just had trouble scheduling the next one, but things are stabilizing, and I think we'll be able to do more of these. And I always enjoy these conversations, Edgar. I really appreciate you coming on here. It's obviously... A very technical conversation and it's beyond what we typically would try to get into here but i think that in you know we talk about audiophiles as being in the pursuit of realism you know they're they're trying to it's not just enjoyment it's about wanting to reproduce as accurately as possible the original intent of that music and in in my to kind of wrap this up in my own exploration of that idea of hearing the original intent, I, I saw it not as what did the mix engineer intend? I don't know how to know what that would be, but what would it have been like if I was at that performance, assuming it was a real performance? And to me, that's realism. And I think when you really think about that problem, you realize rather quickly that the traditional approaches we've used are destined to fail. They can't achieve that. 
And then inevitably you find yourself here with the stuff that you're looking at. It's a fundamentally different way of recording music, thinking about it and also reproducing it. And so I think we have to have these conversations so that we can start to better understand what really what realism means when we talk about reproducing audio. And, and I get, you know, I think you and I have talked about this too, studio recordings, realism is uh, kind of arbitrary because the studio recording is a, a, just a, a sort of false edifice of, of music. It's something that just sort of thrown together. And, and while there's something interesting to be heard there, there is no real event to reproduce. Um, yeah, I mean, you're starting from an artificial construct. Uh, you can enhance it by making it uh, not stuck to the speakers, extrude in 3D space. But yes, at the end, it's, it's artificial in the first place, artificial at the end. And that's perfectly fine. The yeah, it's still I enjoyable. Emphasize there are, I mean, these tools, they are, two, they are of two types. But one set of tools is to enhance existing recording stereo. And this is why this is these the software originally developed for the lab uh, and research labs and universities and companies who are exploring special audio became used by uh, be, were packaged and now used by audiophiles. But there are advanced tools which now are not used by audiophiles have to do with, with content creation, which are not yet standard in pro audio, which they will become. I mean, there's no doubt about it, they will become because they're already standard in ARVR. You know, enigmatic right. reality, uh, virtual reality, and so now we are at the border in the, my presentation between tools that are, uh, which I presented today, that are, can be applied to existing recording, and tools for creating new content or exploring sound, in spatially in very powerful ways, that couldn't didn't exist only a few years ago, and that's not yet, uh, relevant directly relevant to audio files. Uh, that's towards the end of my talk, like this HOA talk we just talked about. I just want to make sure that the border is understood that um, we're now treading into advanced topics that are <laughs> exciting, but not necessarily going to be used by the, every guy in his uh, stereo at home. For sure. Well, I think what we were just discussing probably has more to do with content creation than reproduction. That's right. But um, yeah, so, so again, thank you very much. I appreciate you coming on the show. We'll certainly look for a time for a part three. And I'll just say to everybody, until next time, keep listening. Thank you.